It's good to see you, and we're all ready to dig into the Gospel of Mark, and I've really been wanting to study one of the Gospels, and I've been looking forward to this, and as I began to read and study and do the work in our workbook, I realized that there was a danger for me in studying a Gospel account. And if our tech team could please show that photo slide. That's me. <laughs> that is me. Um, throughout most of my illustrious career as a junior high student, I wore braces, which, as you can imagine, added to the interesting and crazy ride that is many people's experience in junior high. And finally, there came the day right before our eighth grade graduation ceremony that I got my braces off. And I came to school the next day triumphantly, only to find that most people at first did not notice that I got my braces off. <laughs> they were so used to seeing me as I was. They were so familiar with me that they didn't see something transformational that had happened. And I think that this is so similar to how we can grow a little too accustomed, a little too familiar with the gospel story. So that's the danger that I realized about myself, but I don't want to be so used to reading these accounts that I miss what God has to teach me. So let it be our prayer that God gives us fresh vision to see the wonder of all that he's done for us in the good news. Well, Don did a great job last time with our kickoff, giving us an overview and introduction to the book of Mark the last time we met. And we can certainly see just these first few verses in that it is a fast-paced, action-packed account. But before we get to our passage for today, I want to read to you a list of items. And as I read, I want you to be thinking about what these things have in common or what they represent. You ready? Okay, so here's the list. Gutenberg Bible, Boston Tea Party, Industrial Revolution, Wright Brothers, Penicillin, Pearl Harbor, Color Television, I Have a Dream, Moon Landing, Mobile Phones, Berlin Wall, September 11th, 2001. Well, you've probably guessed by now that what all these things have in common, what they represent, are major turning points in human history. They are events, or inventions, or people, or landmarks that changed the course of history from that time forward, and life was different for all of us afterward. And you know this list could go on, but there's one event not on that list that was history's greatest turning point, an event which not only changed the course of history for humanity in this life, but in the life to come. It was the coming of Jesus Christ. It was the incarnation when God became flesh and dwelled among us and brought us the good news of his salvation. This is the great turning point that the book of Mark announces to us. So let's go ahead and turn there now in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1, verses 1 to 15, and we'll read our passage for today. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version of the scripture. Mark chapter one. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance 
for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Well, you can see this passage starts off with a bang, and we've got several important events that the author Mark records at the start of his account. And to help us think through these events, I've organized them under four headings, which you will see on your handout. You have the first letter of each word, and each of these will be the preparation, the presentation, the provocation, and the proclamation. And I'm gonna remind you of those as we go through it, so don't worry about trying to remember it now. You probably also noticed that unlike the other gospel accounts, Mark doesn't give us any background on the life of Jesus, nor the backstory of John the Baptist. Uh, there's no genealogy of the lineage of Christ. There's no Christmas story. There's nothing about John's parents. There's no mention of Jesus' interaction as a boy with the religious leaders in the temple in Jerusalem. We've picked up the story at the start of Jesus' earthly ministry, but this is Mark's intention. This is the grand opening, if you will. Not that we would think of the Christmas story as a soft opening, but remember, we've had a 30-year gap between those events and the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Jesus settled into an ordinary life growing up in Nazareth. Do you think the, the shepherds ever said to each other, like, whatever happened to that baby? And although we can fill in some of the blanks left by Mark from the other gospel accounts, just like Don was talking about earlier, we also need to realize that his purpose for writing is driving the story. And God has important things to reveal to us through Mark's unique account. Mark is emphasizing important events that support his purpose statement, which we see in the very first verse. Mark's purpose is to tell us the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, this is a little bit of a recap, but when we first read this, we might tend to think of the word gospel as a category of literature, but that's not what this is saying. What this and all the gospel accounts are pointing to is the idea that gospel means good news. It is the announcement of good news as reported by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And in this case, we're looking at what God inspired Mark to record. This is the announcement of the beginning of the time of salvation prophesied about by God in the Old Testament, such as we read about in Isaiah 52, 7, where it says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. How about the passage that the Lord Jesus read about himself from Isaiah 61? one to two that says the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, 
to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And remember that Jesus told those who were listening to him today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Well, as I said earlier, this announcement describes the most important turning point in history. And commentator William Lane puts it this way, Mark announces Jesus' coming as an event that brings about a radically new state of affairs for mankind. So it's clear from Mark's opening statement that the good news is tied to the person of Jesus Christ. And the name Christ is a term that refers to him being the anointed one of God or the Messiah who would accomplish God's divine plan of salvation for his people and usher in God's kingdom as the long promised everlasting king from the lineage of King David. Mark also tells us that Jesus is the son of God, meaning Jesus is one in nature with God. And Mark's whole focus from this point on will be to demonstrate this truth about the person and work of Jesus Christ. We also see that this turning point begins with a key figure prophesied about in the Old Testament, the forerunner who will prepare the people for the coming of the Messianic King. Mark notes that this is a fulfillment of prophecy. God is keeping his word. And he takes us to a couple of passages that he's merged together from Malachi 3.1 and Isaiah 40 verse 3. They describe this special messenger and his special assignment, and he quotes them in verses 2 and 3 of Mark chapter 1, which says, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Well, this brings us to our first heading, the preparation. The preparation. To use Mark's favorite word, immediately, we see that immediately following this quote from the Old Testament, we are told that John appeared and that he was baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Mark would have us know, says commentator Alan Cole, that the gospel era was ushered in by John. And William Lane adds that it was not for John's own sake, but as the beginning of the unfolding drama of redemption, which centers in Jesus of Nazareth. Here is our special messenger sent to prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah, ushering in this new era. And this preparation involves baptizing and proclaiming the need for repentance. And crowds of people were coming out to the wilderness in response to John's ministry, repenting, confessing their sins, being baptized in the Jordan River. But we should note that this wasn't referring to Christian baptism. This is before Jesus commissions his followers to baptize disciples after his resurrection. This is more like a ceremony of purification in order to signify a change of heart, of mind, of purpose in a person's life. That's what the word repentance means, change of mind. So this preparation for the way of the Lord, this making of straight paths involves the straightening out of the attitudes of the people toward God and toward their sin. This wasn't preparation of physical roads, it was the preparation of hearts and minds that needed to turn from sin in order to respond in faith to the good news of the salvation being brought by God's anointed one. And I wanna pause here for just a moment of application to talk about repentance. We'll see in this passage from both the message of John and then the proclamation of Jesus that repentance is an essential component of coming to faith in Jesus and in his good news of salvation. But we have to know the bad news, right? Before we can receive and appreciate the value of the good news. That is, we have to understand that our sin 
separates us from God, who is holy and righteous and just, and apart from the salvation he offers, we are destined to suffer his wrath for breaking his law and an eternity in hell separated from him. That is the bad news. But the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is that God offers us salvation through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus when we place our faith in him who paid the penalty for our sin. The proper response to this amazing gift of salvation offered to us in Jesus is to repent and believe in him. And we have to keep in mind that repentance isn't just for new believers. Repentance is an attitude toward sin that should continue throughout the life of a believer in Jesus. Like the people who responded to John the Baptist's message, are we people willing to confess our sins, to repent, to change our mind, to change direction, turning from sin to place our faith in Jesus? Are we willing to continue to have a posture of repentance toward God in the future? Now, this John was an unusual character, wasn't he? His unusual clothing of camel hair, his leather belt, his diet of locusts and wild honey would remind us of the description in the Old Testament of the prophet Elijah. In similar fashion, John was the New Testament version of an Elijah prophet who had arrived to announce that the time has come for God's anointed one to bring salvation to God's people. And we have to remember that this momentous occasion had broken the silence of a few hundred years, during which time no prophet had been carrying the message of God to his people. And the people were waiting. But now the time had come. The time had come, and not only did John preach about repentance for the forgiveness of sins, but he also pointed people to Christ as their Savior. As our own Pastor Philip says, John's job was to clear the way, prepare the way, and get out of the way. John described Jesus as being mightier than him, that he is so exalted that John was not even worthy to do the most menial task of the lowliest slave to untie Jesus's sandals. He also told his audience that the baptism of Jesus, who would baptize with the Holy Spirit, would be superior to John's baptism, which was a baptism of water, because the baptism of Jesus would powerfully transform a person from the inside out. Whereas John's baptism was simply an external sign of a person's desire to turn from sin. It was a good start. It was a necessary start. But what Jesus had to offer was much, much more. And this, too, was a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. We read in Joel 2, 28 to 29, that God promises to pour out his spirit on his people. And in Ezekiel 36, 27, God tells his people, And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So what God had promised was later fulfilled in Jesus as he would baptize with the Holy Spirit. And we'll see the Holy Spirit mentioned three times in these first 15 verses of Mark 1. Jesus' ministry is a Holy Spirit-empowered ministry. So John makes this declaration about Jesus, and in the very next verse, we are introduced to this exalted one. And we're told that in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove, And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. 
Well, now this brings us to our second heading, the presentation. The presentation. We are presented with this person that John has been talking about, Jesus of Nazareth, and two things take place. Jesus is baptized by John, and second, we have this supernatural appearance of the Holy Spirit descending on him, the heavens being torn open like a curtain, and the voice of God speaking from heaven about Jesus. Well, this is a striking event for a couple of reasons. I mean, first of all, we see that Jesus is baptized by John, which might have us puzzled. Because why would Jesus participate in a baptism for sinners in need of repentance and forgiveness? Jesus was sinless. He didn't have any reason to repent. Well, we know from the gospel account of Matthew that John initially objects to baptizing Jesus for this very reason. But Jesus tells him to permit it to fulfill all righteousness. So the purpose of Jesus' baptism was not because he needed to repent of his sins. It was to fulfill the righteous requirements of God because he lived in perfect obedience to God the Father. And remember, he would credit his record of righteous living to us believers as he would take on the guilt and penalty of our sin. Remember 2 Corinthians 5.21 says God made him who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus was also baptized to identify with sinners in their need for forgiveness, the forgiveness that he would secure through his death on the cross. Pastor Philip says in both Calvary and the Jordan, he takes the place appropriate for the sinner even though he committed no sins of his own. And John MacArthur says, The sinless lamb submitted to a baptism designed for sinners, a foreshadowing of the fact that he would soon submit himself to a death deserved by sinners. Thus it was fitting for him to be baptized in order that he might fulfill all righteousness, both as an act of obedience to the Father's will and as a way to identify with sinners for whom he would die as a righteous substitute. Well, secondly, what is amazing about Jesus' baptism is that we have this view of the Trinity, a word not found in Scripture but used to describe the three persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit. As Jesus is coming up out of the waters of baptism, he sees the Holy Spirit appearing and descending on him like a dove. Not that the Spirit is actually a dove, but this is a figurative term used to describe the visible sign of the Spirit alighting on him. And the voice from heaven, which is God the Father, declares that Jesus is his beloved Son, in whom he is well pleased. Charles Spurgeon says the entrance of Christ upon his public ministry on earth was the chosen opportunity for the public manifestation of the intimate union between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now remember that although Jesus was and is God, he laid aside the free exercise of his divine privileges in order to take on human nature and dwell among us. So the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus, anointing him and empowering him as the messianic king for his ministry and for his mission. And in God the Father's declaration, we see his great love for Jesus as his one and only son, highlighting their special relationship to one another and confirming the deity of Jesus. The Father shows his approval of Jesus and presents him to the world as the only one qualified to fulfill his special assignment as God's anointed one, the Messiah, who would give his life to bring many sons to glory. 
Yet, although this is a glorious moment, we read in verses 12 and 13 of Mark 1 that the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Well, this is an unexpected turn of events in this story, which leads us to our third heading, the provocation the provocation. There's no time for celebration as Jesus is presented to the world because the the Spirit immediately drove Jesus into the wilderness for 40 days. And once again, Mark's description of of this event is pretty sparse. (laughs) We find out more details from the other Gospels. However, one thing he includes that the others don't is the fact that Jesus was with the wild animals, which adds an element of danger that we wouldn't otherwise know about, along with the fact that the angels ministered to Jesus during this time. And since we know from the other accounts that Jesus went without food the entire time, we start to get a really good picture of Jesus' suffering over this time period in isolation, in severe hunger, growing physically weak, in a harsh and dangerous environment, facing constant provocation from the devil for 40 days. Have you ever thought about that? We have that one account of the conversation between Jesus and the devil where he uses scripture to answer him back, but it was 40 days long that Jesus was being tempted by the devil, not just that one instance, 40 days. Now, when we read that the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness, we shouldn't think that this implies that Jesus was unwilling to go, but rather that the Spirit was impelling Jesus to go into the wilderness for the specific purpose of facing a battle with the evil one. And I think it's important to note that God is not doing the tempting because according to James 1.13, he does not tempt anyone to sin, but God does permit us to be tested. In this instance, Jesus submits to the testing not because of any need to strengthen his faith or his character, but because he was demonstrating his complete power and authority over the devil as the righteous, sinless Son of God. I'm indebted to Alistair Begg and Sinclair Ferguson for helping me think through the significance of the temptation of Jesus, which they say is not solely about teaching us how to respond to temptation, which it does, but rather it demonstrates the pivotal truth of 1 John 3, 8, which tells us the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. I'll let them explain a bit more in their own words. This is from their book, Name Above All Names, where it says, Jesus' temptations constitute an epic confrontation taking place within divine strategy. What we see here is Jesus' work of conflict, victory, and salvation. He came face to face with Satan. He appeared as God's new man, the second Adam, to do what the old man, the first Adam, had failed to do. Well, let's stop and just let that sink in because we can find such great encouragement in this truth about who Jesus is and what he has done for us. Not only does his temptation in the wilderness teach us that he sympathizes with us in our weakness and he understands what it's like for us to be tempted in our weakest, most vulnerable moments, yet he never sinned, but it shows us his complete victory over sin and the devil. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have been delivered from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, and the devil no longer has dominion over you. And the power of sin no longer has a hold on you because you have the ability to resist temptation. All of this was accomplished for us by Jesus who defeated the power of sin and the evil one. Well, finally, we move to our fourth heading, 
the proclamation. The proclamation. Though Mark doesn't tell us this, we know that Jesus emerges victorious from his time in the wilderness, and after a period of time, he officially begins his preaching ministry. Let's pick back up with our last couple of verses from our passage, verses 14 and 15, where we read, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. We'll find out a little bit more about John's arrest later on in chapter 6 of Mark's gospel. He goes back and describes that period of time. But some commentators believe that Jesus came to Galilee about six months after his baptism, and now he has begun to proclaim God's message of salvation, the gospel of God, in the region of Galilee. He tells people that the time is fulfilled, which means that the time in human history that was predetermined by God for the unfolding of his plan through Jesus had finally come. Jesus declares, says William Lane, that the critical moment has come. God begins to act in a new and decisive way, bringing his promise of ultimate redemption to the point of fulfillment which is like what we read in Galatians 4.4, 4, right? But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. As we talk about Jesus saying the time is fulfilled, I want to take a moment to point out that we've been talking a lot today about the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy and about God's promises and his timing in the events unfolding in our passage. Has someone ever made a promise to you that took a long time, perhaps even years, to fulfill? There are many things that can interfere with or delay someone's good intentions, right? But that's not so with God. Even though God doesn't often fulfill his promises in the time frame that people expect or maybe even want, I mean, I'll bet God's people had been wondering why, why it took so long for the Messiah to come. But at just the right time, God sent his son, as it tells us in Romans 5, 6. Unlike people, God's timing is always perfect according to his perfect plans. Well, have you encountered disappointment in your life from people who didn't keep their promises to you? Well, what we know about the character of God, what we see evidenced in his word and even in our own life experience is that he has kept and he is keeping and he will keep his promises. Our hope in him to keep his promises will never disappoint. What effect does that have on you knowing that God's timing is always right and you can always trust in him to keep his word? Well, Jesus also tells people that the kingdom of God is at hand or near, which did not mean, as some may have thought at the time, that God was going to overthrow the Romans and liberate his people through a political revolution. The kingdom of God, which is the rule of God over his creation, had come near because the king of the kingdom, Jesus Christ, had arrived on the earth. In essence, says John MacArthur, Jesus is saying, because I am the king, wherever I am, my kingdom is present. And how does one enter this kingdom? Repent, says Jesus, and believe in the gospel. Now, we've already seen the importance of repentance in this process through the ministry of John the Baptist, but Jesus adds to this the most important element, faith. Those who would enter the kingdom must believe in the gospel, God's plan of salvation through Jesus. For without faith, says Hebrews 11:6, it is impossible to please him, that is God, for whoever would draw near to God 
must believe that he is and that he rewards those who seek him. Winston Churchill became the Prime Minister of Britain on May 10th, 1940, in the midst of World War II. And he was quoted as saying, I felt that all my past life had been but a preparation for this hour and for this trial. And the British Imperial War Museum's website says, on the very day that Churchill fulfilled his life's ambition, Germany had that morning invaded France, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg. Britain faced its supreme test. It is for his leadership through these fraught years of 1940 to 1941 that Churchill is best remembered. Well, certainly it is hard to picture, I mean, almost impossible to picture how things would have gone for Britain, for the allied nations, for the world, if Churchill had not been at the helm of his country in this dark hour for the world. And yet his contribution, which was brilliant, and the contributions of others like him throughout our history don't even begin to come close to the impact that the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ had on the world. It was indeed history's greatest turning point. Let's not be so familiar with this story that we lose the wonder of this truth. And let's not miss what God has to teach us about his gospel in the coming weeks as we dig deeper into his word. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what you have revealed to us in Jesus, what you have given us in your plan of salvation. Lord, we do want to be able to experience the wonder of that again, history's greatest turning point, the greatest person, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that as we just continue our study in Mark, that it would not be so familiar to us that we fail to see the things you have to teach us. And Lord, most of all, we want to be like Jesus and we want to be transformed by your word. So let there be fruit from our study as well, God. And we give you all the glory and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.